Okay, uh, let's begin lecture. And uh, hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end of class today to talk about exam three, although we've talked about it a little bit already, quite a bit. Get your clickers ready. We're going to click in a few minutes. Um, we're going to do some demonstrations up here in a few minutes, but before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about homework and clicking and so forth. Now, as of Tuesday, we had 65 clicker questions, starting with lecture six. And so uh, we had 17 lectures for that. So that's roughly four uh, per lecture. Um, let me ask you a question. Can you calculate 85% of 65 real quick? It's going to be 50 something, I believe. 55 point. Anybody verify that? 55.25? Okay. So what that means is, okay, so 56 will be the first whole number. So if you have 56 questions answered, that means automatically, ding, you have 25 out of 25. Now listen carefully. We're asking almost four questions per lecture. It's 3.8 something, right? 65 right now. And 56 will get you full pointage. So what that means is 65 minus 56 is nine questions. That's rough. That's a little bit more than two. That's two full lectures. So that's what I was. That's what I've been telling you all semester. Because we have the eighty-five percent leeway factor, it means that you have one or two lect. I usually say it this way: you have one or two lectures to burn. That if you're absent, you can still get twenty-five out of twenty-five for participation. All right. And that's what we got. Nine questions missed is a, just about two lectures. All right. Now, we got more coming today. All right. So 65 is not going to last for more than a few more minutes. But, you know, we're, you know, we're almost at the end of the semester. And so uh, now uh, we might be, you know, depending on how many clicker questions we get to today, uh, we might be at 70 by the end of the day. But whatever we are um, at the end of the, the day today, I'm going to post your Roundup uh, data this afternoon. And uh, so that'll be in your grades page as usual. And so it might be 70 or some number. It won't be 65 because we're going to be asking some questions today. I'll also post a new thread in discussions about how to do it in case you're a little rusty. For those students that are absent today, you can double check it there. Um, how to get the uh, clicker pointage figured out, something out of 25. But if you have, if, you know, but right now, if you have 56 questions answered, you're golden. Okay? And if you're here today, you're going to click in just a few minutes, and you're going to be golden. All right? But if you're below 56, then maybe you have some calculating to do. So, Anyways, we'll, we'll try to get that handled, this or at least published this afternoon. Um, another thing, the homework right now, um, you know, that's, we've got a ton of points. Let's do a rundown on the homework. That converts by straight percentage uh, over to 25, per, 25 points or more for your grade. So as of this morning, there are 295 scores 
in homework, and that includes 75 over in the Great River mini reviews. All right, so, um, and, but I, I don't think everybody's done all of them. Uh, the chapter six is now active, and so is chapter seven mini review. And they're due on Tuesday before the exam. So, uh, and they're not ginormous, so try to get those done. And do your other, we'll have some more homework this weekend and web courses as well. So we got a lot of stuff to do to get you ready for exam three. Um, so pretty large homework and web courses. Um, and that's coming up. So, you know, it, it's entirely possible, that, you know, it might be 20 points, right? So it's possible that we might be up to 315 by the time exam, two, exam three is on the books. So, um, and, you know, and so, you know, I've been having students ask me, well, Dr. B, how do I calculate my grade again? Uh, and what we're going to do is um, we're going to post in discussions and talk about it, All right? I'll post a thread on how to do that. But with, you know, with homework, it's pretty, it's pretty cinchy. You just take how, what you scored, you add up all your homework scores, Great River and Web Courses, you know, so that might be 288 or something, you know. If it's 315, I mean, you've got everything, you, you got 25. But if you have less than that, you just go by percentage. So you divide by 315 and then multiply by 25. So it'll look something like this, all right? So let's say that you have, go ahead and write this down uh, and this will help you figure out what to do with your homework part of your grade. You know, let's say that you have 288 and you wanna figure out your pointage today uh, or at the end of the weekend at, at the basis of 315. So you go 288 divided by 315, that's in this square bracket, that's your percentage, then multiplied by 25, and that, and so that's 25 times 0 0.9143. So this student has 91.43%, you know, two eight, that's pretty good, you know. And so you multiply that out, and so the 288 converts to 22.86. And then I always round up. Now, when you're doing a calculation, uh, Tori, on the test, you want to round up if you're at 0.5 or higher. You want to round down if you're below 0.5. That's for doing a calculation on the test. You want to get the, the right round off. But for you guys, the only time I round up is homework and participation. So give you guys the benefit, benefit of the roundup. Okay, that's just to keep things simple. So this guy's gonna round up 22.86. He's gonna round up to 23 out of 25 anyways. But if he had come in at 22.00006, Round up to 23, all right? So no, no matter, you know, if you break 22.00 something, just call it a 23 and, you know, take it and take the money and run. By the way, I'd like to mention another thing about bonus pointage. I haven't really talked too much about it. We've only had... Um, we've only had a few early registration of iClicker bonus points for possible. And I know some of you didn't get any of those and some of you only got one, uh, but we got more coming up bonus points and we got bonus point opportunities coming up that everybody can, can take part in. Now here's, here's the, two that I have in mind. And they're gonna be after Thanksgiving. So next Tuesday, we're gonna have our exam. And then Thursday, you're, we're all gonna be off eating turkey and pumpkin pie and all that kind of stuff. 
At my house, we make sweet potato pie. I make the sweet potato pie. It's very good. And But then after Thanksgiving, we're going to have two regular lectures. Now, the Thursday lecture that week after Thanksgiving, traditional, that's the, the, I think it's November 30th. Could somebody look that up on the, on the calendar? Is no, I think it's November 30th, the last Thursday. 29th, okay. So, November, all right, November 30th is last Friday. And then, all right, so our last lecture is the 29th. Yeah, because Thanksgiving is the 22nd. All right, so our last lecture is the 29th. Now, at the last mm, 30, 40 minutes of the last lecture of the semester, I traditionally set aside oh, 30 or 40 minutes for you guys to do a review set using your eye clickers and a handout. Now, on exams, you have an eye clicker page, and so far it's only been mm, two or three questions, three, four questions. On that last day of lecture, I'll give you a handout with 15 questions maybe, including a couple calculations. But you'll click it in in self-paced mode like we do on exam. So you can work with your, your friends that are sitting with you, or you can find a friend and make a friend if you want and work on the, the, uh, the review set. And I'll convert that. Now, you got to get them all right. you got to do your best. It's not participation. It's bonus points. So if I give you 50, if, if there's 15 points and you score 15, you'll get four bonus points. But if you score less than 15, you know, like if you get 11 points, you know, I might calculate that down to two out of four bonus points. But you still get some, right? So, you, so that's a four-point bonus opportunity. So even if you didn't get your clicker till after the deadline, you can still nab those four bonus points if you come to that lecture. And everybody's supposed to come to the lecture. Second, another bonus point opportunity I traditionally do after Thanksgiving will be that weekend between our last lecture on the 29th and the final, which for you guys is the Tuesday, 10 a.m., don't come at 10.30, come at 10 a.m. That weekend, I usually set up a mega review homework. You know, so trotting out stuff from the first week and all the way up till that week. All right, so it'll be a little... No, excuse me, it won't be little, it'll be a mega review. And traditionally, I convert that into four bonus points. All right, and you'll have like, you know, 10 attempts, and so, you know, most of you will crush it, which is good, because I want, you know, basically I'm giving you bonus points in order to study for the final. And that'll help you get a better grade on the final, hopefully, if you do it. Now, you don't have to do it, you don't have to do anything in this class. There's nothing that's required. Attendance is not required. Exams are not required. And neither is an A. Your grade, you know, so the grade is up to you, what you want to do. All right? But so we got bonus points coming. All right? And, uh, and hopefully, if, you know, like this guy, uh, John Q. student here with 288, if that were the end of the semester... Uh, and he comes in with 23 out of 25, that's all right. But it's not 25 out of 25, which is what you want for homework. And you want 25 out of 25 for clicking, for participation. But if you don't have that, you can get some bonus points and go over the... So if you, if you have this, and then for bonus points, you actually have 27 out of 25. Just think of it that way. It's nice. And you add up your clicking and your homework pointage, that's going to be some number out of 50. And for many of you, you'll have 50 out of 50 homework and participation together. And that's the same weight as a midterm. So most of you guys are putting together some nice grades. Uh, you just don't know it. And, uh, but anyway, so my objective today is to try to get you guys 
updated grade-wise so you can know as of today what your grade is looking like. Now we've got exam three coming up, so it'll change as soon as we do that best two out of three maneuver. And that'll be a change again. But we're getting closer, we're getting closer, closer, closer. All right. Also, another comment, exam two PDFs are now out for everybody that asked for one. If you didn't ask for one, you don't get one. Except I sent one to, to one student I knew would want it. But um, So those are out, and you can use those. Now I gotta put the blurb sheets up for you guys for the various test forms. I'll try to do that tomorrow. And that together with your uh, Scantron PDF is gonna be helpful as a study guide. By the way, um, I'll mention this again on Tuesday. Uh, we're not going to do PDFs for the exam three results. What we're going to do is print them out on paper and hand the paper printout, same information, it's just printed on paper, uh, the old fashioned way. We'll hand that out in lecture on Tuesday after Thanksgiving. So be here. Um, and we'll do that the first five, 10 minutes. I'll have some other TAs over here to help with that, so, all right. Now, any questions about all this grading jazz? Okay. Um, get your clicker ready. I'm going to ask you an interference question. All right, so this is not interference like somebody bugging you while you're trying to eat pizza. That would be interference of the worst kind. And it's not interference like on the football field, pass interference, defense number 62, first down automatic. It's wave interference, the interference of waves. So I'm going to ask you a question now. Get your clicker ready. At a, about a point out here in the North Atlantic. And remember, last time we talked about interference, you have to have at least two sources of waves. Okay? And where the waves interact between the two sources, that's where you possibly get interference. And last time we talked about, well, what if you have a storm off the coast of Nova Scotia and a, sco a storm off the coast of West Africa? All right, that's in this picture here. So here's Nova Scotia up here, upper left. Here's uh, the Cape Verde Islands down here. Lower, actually, that's the Canary Islands down here. Lower right, that's West Africa. Uh, and you know, we get storms over there, the, the, the hurricanes that are so devastating, they start over here. They come off the Sahara Desert and then they start into a tropical wave. You know where the tropical waves start? Saudi Arabia. That's where they start. I don't know if anybody has ever figured out why that's the case. You know, these tropical waves, when they're running, the tropical waves, they have a wavelength between waves and when you look at the hurricanes you know if we've got a bunch of storms in the north atlantic a lot of times they'll be like it, it'll be like a freight train just going right across you know every thousand miles there's another storm bing bang from africa all the way to maryland or wherever they're heading so let me ask you this riddle me this Question number one for today. At this point X in the North Atlantic, two waves meet at 2.07 and 12 seconds AM. They're in phase crest to crest. What does that produce? Read carefully and make a decision. And this, my wonderful students, I could ask you, Nicole, questions just like this on exam three. You know, I could, you know, I could give you one map and then pepper you with like three or four questions about that map. 
And hey, you guys, as I've said to students all semester, when you're reviewing my YouTubes and your lecture notes, always think, how can Dr. B make this outline? How can Dr. B make this minute of his lecture into a question, a multiple choice, a matching, or a calculation? How can he make it into a brain burner? What kind of brain burner would Dr. B ask about this? This calculation, will it be on a test? Because you know, we do a bunch of calculations, but I don't ask all the same calcula uh, calculations on the exam as we have on lecture. You know, I have to pick and choose. So always think, and you've been in two of my tests now, so you know my wily tricks. At least you have a, a first idea of my wily tricks. But I haven't written the exam yet, so I have to go through the same process. What should I do from, ex from lecture 19? What should I do from lecture 20? And on up to today, lecture 26, for exam three. All right. So let's see what you guys have answered. Uh, 15 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Um, yeah, pretty good. You guys did well. 87% of you got it correct. Yeah, you know what the correct, you know what the, um, you know, the distractor, this, the formal term for a, a tempting option but wrong is distractor. So if I can distract you away from the true answer, that means you don't know the material well enough. But if you do know the material, you won't be distracted by option A. Option A looks nice. Yeah, doubly large crest, because that's what happens. But it's not because of destructive interference. So remember that. Always read carefully when you're doing these. Because I can make, you know, you guys, some of you guys get intimidated by calculations and stuff that we, we do. But really, I can make as many people... Uh, uh, experience a, a brain burning sensation with multiple choice if I wanted to. I mean, I could make 50 points, multiple choice, 50 dots, Scantron only. I sometimes do that. Hmm. 50 Scantron questions. But if I did that, I'd have to make some really, really tough multiple choice. And you know what I, so students were telling me? I don't know who it was. Somebody was telling me, you know, Dr. B, I don't like true-false because I have to really, I know that if, if it's wrong, you know, I, I have to get it right. And I, you know, you know, some people, they just get really burned up by true-false. And I always put true-false in because I think, okay, I'll put in some true-false because they'll be easy. But some of you guys, and I'm not criticizing, it's just the way some people think. You know, they, you know, they don't think in terms of true-false. All right, so let's, let's go and do some demonstrations. Now, go ahead and make a couple notes. We're going to do some demonstrations. These, see these things up here? These are tuning forks. This is a tuning fork mounted on a wooden box, and you can see that the wooden box is hollow. And so it's kind of a sounding uh, device. It kind of amplifies the sound from the tuning fork, and it beams it out in this direction. And I've got two of them. They're identical. All right, and I'm going to show you those. And that's the other demonstration, that coil spring that just went... Uh, off the tabletop. Okay, so we got two of these, then we got a coil spring, and we're going to form a, standing, a set of standing waves with it. 
Um, so now I'm going to try to record uh, the beats with the keen fork uh, into the YouTube. It also, it's, it'll be audible here in the lecture hall, but I want to make it audible for the YouTube as well. Um, and and we have Beats uh, YouTube's uh, on on the YouTube channel, uh, so I'm going to put my headphone over here and keep recording. All right, now, so here are my two tuning forks, and what I have here is a little metal clip. Okay, and this metal clip it just screws on to the tuning fork if I want and it changes the pitch but let's just do the two tuning forks um, the way they are here okay so here's the first one all right so kind of memorize that one okay now here's the second one so what do you think pretty much the same perfect but all right now let's put both of them together they're both putting out the same pitch so that means the same frequency okay so many hertz and same wavelength let's do both nice and loud double amplitude so your your ears are putting together both signals and then your brain is putting it together into one signal, double amplitude. All right, now, let me put on this metal clip onto one of them. And I'm going to put it on the middle. So take a look at this. Here's my tuning fork number one. And I put this metal clip on here, and that's going to change the pitch. All right, so let's see what the pitch... Let's do the the unweighted, okay, there's the reference pitch, and here's the weighted, sound different, let's try it again, Let's do both of them together. Now, we already did the two tuning forks without the weight, and it just sounded double loudness. Now, let's see. Now, this is going to give us beats. I want you to listen carefully. Here we go. Oh, let me turn on this microphone. Okay. This will magnify the beats or the sound. Hear it? That's beats. <coughs> Sounds like a science fiction movie. You know, the mad scientist comes into his lab. Beats. Now, the, the traffic cop, when he's got a radar gun on you, he, he beams his radar gun at your car. If your car is moving away from him, the radar signal will reflect off your car and come back at a slightly flat frequency like this one. So he'll combine, and he's got this one programmed into his device. And so he'll compare the frequencies and then there's a fairly simple formula to compute the speed uh, from the beat frequency. Now, let me change the location of the weight. I'm going to dip it downward to about a third. Okay, so this is a little bit below where it was. Okay. Now, let me ask you a little mental IQ test question here. When I 
cap this one, is it going to be lower than before or higher? Lower? You think it's going to be lower? Let's check it. All right, here's the reference. It's not as big of a deviation. Now, let's see if we can hear beats with this. I've changed the two frequencies. Well, I've changed one frequency. Let's listen. Hear it? The B frequency is slower. It's a lower frequency because this weighted one is actually closer to the original unweighted. Tuning four. Let's try it again. Oh man, you can feel it. I can feel it with my hand up here. Spectacular. Usually I get my TAs to do this. Oh man, the water up here. Sweet. The water's picking up the sound waves. Nice. Unbelievable. All right, now, let me bring this one all the way to the top. Now, this one's going to be really low frequency. Reference. Weighted. Whoa. Really flat, really down. Okay. Now, that means that the two frequencies are farther apart. So, the... The B frequency is the difference. So this is going to be a big, high beat frequency. You might not even hear it. Let me do that again. Let me bring it down just a little bit. I don't want this thing. This thing is. Anyway, so B frequency, and here's the kicker. If you're in a car moving away from the police officer, you, your car will get, give a signal back to the police officer like this. This tuning fork, it'll be, you know, it's some pitch, but not, it won't be this pitch. If you're at rest, you know, if you're stopped, it'll come back exactly at the reference frequency. But if you're moving away, it'll come back at a lower frequency and you can compute the speed from that. Also, if it's if you're coming toward the police officer at 37 and a 25 like it happened to me, the comeback frequency will be higher. If the source is coming towards you, the frequency is higher, the pitch is higher. And that applies for sound waves too. Now you may have noticed that um, when you're out and about and you listen to a train blow its whistle, blow its horn, or an ambulance, you know, turn on its siren, and as it goes past you, it goes down in pitch. That's the same thing. It's called the Doppler effect. Now, I need a volunteer from the audience, to, other than Rachel. Not Rachel. You want to help? <laughs> okay, come on up. She hasn't done anything yet. All right, come on up here. Yeah, sure. What is your name again? Jessica. Okay, Jessica. Yeah, I want you to hold that. And I want you to hold it right here by your waist. Okay. Real tight. Real strong, okay. solid. Now don't hold it. Hold it like this. Okay. Good. Like with two hands? Yeah, put your other hand on top of your hand. Yeah, just like that. Okay. Good and solid. Okay, back up a little bit. Okay, now all, all you got to do is hold it. Now what I've got here is a coil spring. All right, and I'm going to start sending waves from me towards Jessica. So here's the first. Let's move forward a little bit so everybody can see. Okay, so here's the first one. 
Nice. <laughs> it goes from me over to Jessica, and then it bounces back. Let me, let me do it again, watch. I'm just gonna do one wiggle. It'll go from me to Jessica, then it'll reflect off her hands. That's why you have to keep them really still. And then it'll come back towards me. And then it'll reflect from here. And go back towards, and so it'll, until it dissipates all sense. All right, here we go, one, one ball. See that? All right, now. If I keep sending waves at Jessica, at Jessica, <laughs> they'll keep coming back at me. So I'll be getting interference from the waves traveling right to left, and I'll be sending out waves left to right. So we're gonna get interference. And if we do it at just the right rate, we'll get something called a standing wave. It'll wave, it'll oscillate, <coughs> but like this one, I'm just gonna send out one. It moves left to right, and then right to left, and then right, left to right, and then right to left again. Okay. If I do it at the right rate, it'll just move, it'll move up and down, but it won't see. It'll, it will be moving, the waves will be moving, but they won't appear to be moving. They'll appear to be standing. There'll be oscillation, but there won't be apparent motion. All right. And here's the lowest, I'm gonna to try to get the lowest frequency one. So this is like, la, 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 la. This is like in the, when you're in the playground, you're doing jump rope, okay? okay. Students, make a sketch of this. That the wave, don't laugh, make a sketch. A bump between one end point and the other end point, and a dip. And that's the oscillation. I'm sending waves towards Jessica, and she's reflecting them back at me at the same rate, so same frequency, and it's the right frequency that they interfere constructively to give me a, and this is called the fundamental mode. So go ahead and make a note. Fundamental mode or ground state. If this were an atom, <coughs> This would be the electron in its ground state. All right, now, let me get the next mode, the first excited mode. This is gonna be higher frequency, and I'm gonna try to get one bump and one dip. And see if I can get that kind of a stand. Let's see if we can do it. All right, so you just stand up, that's what it is. And see, if you, if you don't get the right, there it is. So go ahead and make a sketch of this. A bump and a dip, and then a dip and a bump. And notice that this is higher frequency. And if I slow down a little bit, it gets all discombobulated. Okay, if I speed up a little bit, it'll get, let me see if I can get it again. Go ahead and make another sketch. Here it is. First excited state. This is the first harmonic. What do you call it? All right, let me see if I can get another higher frequency standing wave. This one's going to be, you'll sketch this one as two bumps and a dip, or two dips and a bump. Okay, so let's see if I can get that. Tough, much tough. Step back a little bit. Okay, first excited state. Let me tighten this up a little bit. Is that it? <laughs> bump and a dip, dip and a bump, or no, two, whoa. It's tough operating. It's, it's actually difficult to get it right. There it is. Is that it? Okay, make a 
sketch of that if you can. It's very tough. And I've gotten it up to the, the next highest mode, the third excited state. Very, very tough. All right, Jessica, let's give Jessica a hand now, please. And that, my wonderful students, is the phenomenon called standing waves. And we shall use standing waves after Thanksgiving to understand the periodic table. That is why we are doing all of this. Now let me put this equipment over here to the side. Oh boy. <laughs> and let's continue with lecture. Let me turn off this. Okay, so that's standing waves. And make a note that standing waves only happen when the length of the wave containment, you know, the distance between Jessica and me, is, has a specific ratio with the wavelength and therefore the frequency. So only certain wavelengths are allowed. So if, if Jessica and I stand 12 feet apart, only certain frequencies will work because only certain wavelengths will work. Between Jessica and me in the fundamental mode, that is half of a wavelength. So if you say that 12 feet is equal to half a wavelength, that means that one wavelength is 24 feet. And then you figure out the wavelength from that. That's your wave, or you figure out the frequency from that. And then the second one, the first excited state, the first harmonic, uh, one full wave between Jessica and me. So that means that one, for that frequency, 12 feet is equal to lambda exactly. The fundamental mode, half lambda. First excited state, one full lambda. And then the, the second excited state, the third one, the bump and a dip and a bump, oscillating with a dip, a bump and a dip, that's one and a half, 12 feet is equal to one and a half wavelengths. A full bump, a full dip, and then one more bump. So that's one and a half waves between me and Jessica, 12 feet. So that allows you to figure out the, the wavelength and frequency of that one. And only those frequencies and wavelengths match. Now, if Jessica and I move back, if Jessica moves back another two feet, three feet to 15 feet, different frequencies, we'll have to adjust it. But you can measure it. You know, we could, we could have timed out the frequency on those. At least the fundamental, that would have been easy. And when you do, you find out that if you change the distance between your containment, Jessica and me, from 12 to 15, changes the wavelengths that form standing waves. You can get any, you know, you could put any a wave you want on there, but it won't form a standing wave. Only certain frequencies will do that. Now, the reason that we're studying uh, standing waves or d doing that demonstration is because we're heading for the periodic table. And the periodic table, believe it or not, the ellipses that we talked about Tuesday and the standing waves that we just talked about now, it's going to all fit. It's going to co all come together to understand everything about all the cool stuff about the periodic table. So uh, that means electrons and protons in atoms. Now, this device here, this silvery sphere that this young lady is holding on to and her hair is flying out into the universe like that. And you sometimes see this. If you go into YouTube, you can see z zillions of videos like this. Here's another one. This device, this girl's hair is flying out to the universe. It's called a Van de Graaff generator. Now, these two pictures here this one and this one, they were taken in a lab not here at UCF, but this one, 
was taken in the physics department here at UCF just a couple weeks ago. It's a student, and look at her hair. And you can't see the, the Van de Graaff, you can't see the metal sphere, but you can see her uh, right hand, you know, her left hand holding on to it. And I was operating that, uh, that device, and you see her hair flying. I got a bunch of other pictures of it. That's, she was one of the best ones. You never know whose hair is going to work, you know, except you know mine's not going to work because it's really curly and short. But somebody with straightish hair um, and long, it, you, you just never know whose it's going to be. So hopefully I'll be able to bring Van de Graaff generator. Here's a picture of Professor Van de Graaff from MIT. Here's another picture of him standing between the nose. are big ones there. You know, what do we use those for? Well, we, we make an electric field. See, the, the charges produced by this generator go into those spheres, and if you touch the spheres, they'll go into you if you're, if you're not grounded. So if you're up on a piece of plastic that's it's an insulator, it won't go through your body and into the ground. It'll just stay with you, and your hair will fly out uh, into the universe like that. But they put two of them together to make a really big um, electric field between the two. And so there's a picture. So, uh, Professor Van de Graaff, that picture was probably from about World War II era is when he was active. Here's another picture of a Van de Graaff generator. Now, if you look at this, these two little figures down here to the lower left, those are adult humans. So these things are gigantic. And they developed them, this, you know, Van de, Professor Van de Graaff developed them so that they could smash atoms together and see what happens. You know, that's what a lot of experiment, that's what a lot of experimentation is. You know, physics and chemistry and stuff, especially physics, you know, everybody gets the idea, oh, physics, they're so smart and they know everything and, you know, they know all the formulas and stuff like that. But in the lab, you know what we're doing? We're just screwing around. See if we can see what happens. And, then, and, and the only difference is uh, instead of just screwing around and see what happens, we're taking notes so that we can do it again. That's it. That's what experiments are, screwing around and see what happens. So we screw around with atoms and we get two big Van de Graaff generators. And between the two Van de Graaff generators, you know what else you get between the two? Sparks. In fact, if you go to, if you put this name, Van de Graaff, uh, in YouTube, you'll get zillions of YouTubes uh, of Van de Graaff, of, you know, of people's hair going out on end. But also, You'll see big Van de Graaff generators like this. I probably won't see any this size. But like at sci there's like in Boston, I think, they have a science museum up there with some big Van de Graaff generators, and they cause lightning bolts in the auditorium. That's how much uh, potential energy you can get uh, unloaded by these things. Oh, did I say potential energy? Yes. Potent electrical potential energy, EPE, yes. That's the story of the atom. And that's why we're studying it. Here's, here's another thing to help you unravel the story of the atom. WebElements.com. Don't type in the singular, WebElement.com. That's a hijack website. It'll hijack your computer. WebElementsPlural.com is, is really good. You click on any of those elements, you can read, you know, you can read the boiling point of, you know, niobium, the melting point of lead. You, know, you can look up all kinds of properties. How many neutrons in the nucleus? How many pro, you know, periodic table, that tells you that all, for every element. Because... You know, here's, so for instance, here's carbon, carbon. Six, you know, the six, sixth element, carbon. Very important for us. 12.011. That number down at the bottom there is, is a measure of the mass of a single carbon atom in atomic mass units. The six is the number of 
protons in the nucleus of a carbon atom. And if you have six electrons orbiting the carbon atom, it's a neutral carbon atom. And so a lot of the structure of the atom is encoded in the periodic table. And some periodic tables have a lot more data in each cell. You know, this is a fairly simple one, all right? And sometimes they have all kinds of, uh, you know, little sub diagrams and stuff. But anyways, this, they, they encode the basic structure and implicitly um, a lot of the bulk properties as well. So what I mean by that is from first principles, if you know the electromagnetic force, which we're going to study today, and the mass of carbon and, and a few other things, you can figure out the specific heat of carbon from first principle. You don't have to measure it in a lab. That's one of the things that Einstein was able to do. So there's a whole bunch of reasons to understand periodic table, and that's why it's our, our main target. Okay, the electron theory of charge. We now know that uh, this, this stuff, you know, the, the ancient Greeks knew that amber true amber, if you, if you rub it against your toga, you can pick up little pieces of paper. You know, it has a, a, a slight attractive force. They knew that. The Greek word for amber is electron. And so electrons, we now know, uh, are little teeny particles, but that comes from the Greek word for amber. Okay. Now, um, the person that figured out that the objects that carry electric charge is a guy named J.J. Thompson. Here's a picture of him. And he figured out that what made amber do what it does are these things called electrons. Right? Some people thought that electricity was a fluid, Sarah. And, but it's not, a, it's not a fluid because it's made up of electrons and protons. Um, so here's what he did. He, he had this device, right? And this is, this is his device. Uh, it's called a, a cathode ray tube. And in his day, this is about 120, 125 years ago and more. So a little bit, about the time of Max Planck and a little bit before that, they knew that certain elements like uranium and radium produced rays. You know, they knew that that you could get an x-ray, you know, it would expose film, all right? And the, in, the, in the early days, they knew there were three kinds of rays, alpha rays, beta rays, and gamma rays. Now, gamma rays, we still call gamma rays. Those are electromagnetic. They're photons. Beta rays turn out to be electrons. That's what he's trying to, Professor Thompson was trying to figure out. And then alpha rays uh, end up to be uh, helium nuclei. It's kind of weird. But beta rays, they could produce them, but they didn't know much about them. They knew that if you shine beta rays onto some phosphorescent paint, it'll light up the phosphors. You know, kind of like an old-fashioned television. You know, back in the day... So most of you guys don't remember the big, huge televisions that, you know, are big like this. They had a big picture tube in it. And it was basically an electron gun in the back at high voltage and a glass screen on the front painted with red, green, and blue phosphors. And whenever an electron came out of the gun and hit one of those colors, it would shine at the front end of the tube, red, green, or blue. That was color TV, TV and black and white TV in the same principle. 
So Thompson said, look, I can produce these and I can steer them. He could make a beam. You know, all you got to do is take a source of beta rays and then put a tube and you'll get a, a beam of beta rays out the other end of the tube. You know, so, there's, so he tried to channel it into these, between these two plates here. All right, so those two plates are the active parts. So here's kind of a schematic of J.J. Thompson's experiment. So he had a source of beta rays over here on the left. And they were zapping through these two plates. And he said, look, and, you know, I know that when they hit the this blue out here, this is the phosphorus. Right? So this is the inside of his glass tube. It's painted with a little bit of phosphorus. And he said, look, if I, if I make the upper plate positive, you know, hook it up to one end of the battery, and the lower plate negative, hook it up to the other end of the battery, if my beta rays are positive, they'll, be, they'll swing downward because they'll be attracted to the negative plate and repelled by the positive plate. If my beta rays are negative, Bailey, they'll go upward. They'll dip upward slightly. Because it'll if they're negative, they're going to try to get attracted to the positive plate upward and repelled from the lower plate downward. So J.J. Thompson said, look, let's at least figure out if the beta ray is positive or negative. And he did a bunch of other F equals MA and stuff, kinetic energy, work, and all that stuff. And he figured out, first of all, that when he sent them into his device, the phosphorescent screen glowed above the line. And that means that beta rays are negative. He was able to measure the quotient using F equals MA and just basically measuring how fast they were going and, you know, the radius of curvature of their trajectory. Uh, he was able to figure, you know, do, do a bunch of F equals MA, and he was able to figure out that the, the ratio of the electron charge, the beta ray charge, to its mass was extremely small. And so he figured out, because of that, that it was a particle. It wasn't like a wave in the ocean. The electron was a very small particle and that it was negative. All right, now, let's take a look at the summary of what we know today. The metric system unit of charge is the Coulomb, and we're gonna talk about uh, Professor Coulomb in a few minutes. It is the household size charge. It is equivalent to the charge of 6.24 times 10 to the 18 protons. So Thompson was able to figure out that it's a small negative particle. And then another guy, Milliken, in America, in Chicago, he was able to figure out, okay, how, how big is it compared to a Coulomb? Now, you may think to yourself, Dr. B, what is a Coulomb of charge? A Coulomb of charge is a load of charge on human scales. One Coulomb per second going through a wire is, that's the definition of one amp. One ampere of electricity. Now if you go and look at the breaker box or the fuses in your car, the breaker box at your house or your apartment, you'll see that at your house you'll have circuit breakers rated for a few amps. And like the circuit breaker for your uh, air conditioner and maybe your dishwasher, you know, have its own circuit. Uh, washer and dryer, they'll have their own circuit. But the, the elect, you know, the, uh, the air conditioner is gonna have a big, so I don't know what the air conditioner's wattage or uh, amperage rating is. But it's gonna, it might have 30 amps or something. I mean, you can look it up. So a Coulomb per second is an amp, and an amp is a normal size household current. Now, your cell phone works on milliamps and microamps, okay? 
much smaller device. But stuff like your house, you know, you're talking amps. I mean, the breakers are at, at amps, so, you know, certain devices won't. You know, your hair dryer might, might use an amp of electricity for, for when it draws current. But, like, you know, a light bulb might not. So, but household size charge. Now, electrons are negative, so minus one Coulomb is the same number of electrons. So protons and electrons, they have the same size charge, uh, but the electron is negatory. Okay, so that's the metric unit of charge. And you can see it over here. Capital E stands for the charge on the proton and minus E, the charge on the electron. But anyways, E is, is um, and here's the ratio, one Coulomb for every 6.24 times, hold on a second, times 10 of the uh, 18 protons. And that's equivalent to 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 Coulombs per proton. So the natural unit uh, of the fundamental unit of nature is uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. And that would be the charge on the proton. And then, of course, uh, minus that for the electron. That's the smallest one that we can see in captivity or in nature. And... Uh, In atomic systems, periodic table, we're going to start, we're going to think in terms of E, plus and minus E. Minus E for the electrons, plus E for the protons. All right? And, but if you're, if you're doing something at home, you're going to think about coulombs and amperes. A coulomb, um, you can store, if, if you've ever seen somebody with, one of those little joke things where you shake somebody's hand and they, they get a little buzz, electrical buzz, or a taser. If you've ever seen somebody, you know, operating a taser, you know, like that guy up at Flor University of Florida, don't tase me, bro, from whenever that, you guys don't even remember that. It was back in the day. Uh, but anyways, a taser is, is going to give you several, it's going to store maybe a coulomb of charge and then zap you with some of it because it'll it, it it won't use all of it at one zap i guess i mean i've never used a taser but does anybody in here have a taser you do get out of here do you know how many zaps can you get out of it you don't know i would like to you know the other thing that they is like a taser is um, cattle prod. They use it to zap cattle stuff. But those are going to be coulombs. A coulomb, an ampere will kill you. It's not voltage, it's amperes that will kill you because all those electrons flowing through your nervous system, it'll zap your nervous system. You'll just, you know, that's how you get electrocuted. All right, so let's take a look at what we know about the nucleus and the, the atom itself. We know, you know, J.J. Thompson figured out electrons. Another guy named Rutherford figured out protons in the nucleus. And then another guy named Chadwick figured out, okay, there's neutrons, and he found them. And we can find, a neutron has no electric charge. It's about the same mass as the proton. Oh, by the way, the mass of the proton is about 2,000 times the mass of the electron. So in everyday applications, like electronics, either at home with the wiring system or in your cell phone or anything else, it's the electrons that move around. The protons don't really move around. You know, you set up a battery and the protons are so heavy they're not really going to move much. They're going to maybe rattle a little bit, but the electrons go from point A to point B. So the nucleus. We think of it as kind of a bag, you know, no, it's not a spherical shape necessarily. It's contained protons and neutrons. 
And then kind of floating around outside are the electrons. And this picture here uh, is the representation uh, of a helium-4 atom. Uh, helium-4 because there are four uh, particles in the nucleus, two protons, two neutrons. There's another flavor of helium that's two protons and one neutron. That's called helium-3, and we see both of those flavors of helium in nature. And we can make, uh, we can change them back and forth. You may think to yourself, Dr. B, what is it that keeps the nucleus together? Because you look at that nucleus, like charges repel, right? Positives are going to repel. You know, sometimes I look out and see you guys on your phones. It's discouraging. Uh, this nucleus should blow apart because protons, they're, they're not going to want to stay bound together. And neutrons, they don't, you know, they don't care either way because they're neutral. They don't repel anything. So there's something else that's keeping them bound together. And they figured this out about 90 years ago. 19, yeah, 1930s. It's called the strong nuclear force. That's the force that keeps uh, That's the force that keeps the nucleus together, the strong nuclear force. It's one of the three for, one of the four forces of nature. Okay, charging mechanisms. Uh, one of them we've mentioned is by friction. So if you run your comb through your hair, what happens is, you know, if your comb is initially uncharged and your hair is initially uncharged, you know, same number of protons and electrons, um, you can charge both of them and get static effects um, if you, you know, comb your hair. Uh, or if you, if you take a comb and just kind of rub it against your shirt, that'll do the same thing. And what happens is the electrons go, the way that the two materials interact, the plastic comb wants to, uh, hold on to electrons that get jostled out of the hair. And so the hair's going to lose them. So the hair's going to become net positive, and the comb is going to become net negative. Um, and that's how the Van de Graaff generator works, except it's not a comb uh, rubbing against uh, hair. It's a, there's a little conveyor belt made of some kind of material, and it goes up and down from the, gla from the metal sphere down to the base and back again and really fast and there's a metal comb that contacts that by friction and then that metal comb contacts or is wired to the metal sphere and that's how you build up charge on the sphere. So, um, so contact with a charged object. So if you charge, so if you touch this if you want to make something net negative, all you got to do is touch the comb to it, and then the, then the object that you touch will get a few of those electrons. That's why those uh, young ladies with the hair flying out, um, the charges went from the silver Van de Graaff sphere into their body. Now, they, to do that, you have to stand on an insulated platform, you know, basically insulated from the earth by plastic. And then the, those those charges that come off the sphere will go into your body and stay. And then they'll, when, once they go into your body, they'll go to your extremities like your hands, your feet, and your head. And then if, if your hair is the right condition, your hair will stand on end. Uh, so, or you could contact charge. The, this idea of friction is related to 
um, something called the Triboelectric Series. It's basically a list of things that if you rub them together, you'll tend to get positive on one and negative on the other, depending on where you are on the list. So glass and rubber, um, if you rub those together, the glass will tend to become positive, the rubber uh, negative. Wool and amber, here's amber and blue, and wool and red, so the amber tends to become negative because it's on the, the bottom half of this list, and then the wool tends to become positive. So your, your toga, become if you have a wool toga, it'll become a little bit positive, and your amber uh, is going to become a little bit negative. All right. Now, the guy that figured out positive and negative or made the decision which one was going to be which, positive and negative, was Benjamin Franklin. So this is the triboelectric series. So, you know, you can, you know, anything from the top is going to become positive if you, wrap, if you rub it against something from the bottom. So another way that you can um, make an interaction happen is by polarization. And what this does, it induces a rearrangement or a reorientation of atoms and molecules. You know, a water molecule is polar. The hydrogen end is, you know, there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. The hydrogens tend to be the positive end of the molecule, and the oxygen end tends to be negative, so it's slightly polarized. And so, um, and same thing in, in paper. You know, cell, uh, hydrocarbons in paper, cellulose and everything else in there, the carbohydrates. Um, the, the electrons will try to spin away from the comb. The comb is negative. You know, you charge it up in your hair, so now it's negative, right? You bring it near a piece of paper, and it'll attract the positive end of any molecule in there, and that positive end will tend to swing a few degrees or all the way towards the comb. And at the same time, the negative end of the molecules will swing away from the comb. So you tend to polarize here. Um, it's still electrically neutral, but you've redistributed. So now there's positives on top, negatives below that. And that is why you can pick up, you could charge the comb and take a little piece of paper and kind of pick it up with it, right? Because you'll be able to attract it. That little paper, you know, this paper might be too big, but a little tiny fragment of paper, you can do it. Here's another one. This is one that you can do at home, anywhere, really. You take a comb, you rub it on your toga or whatever kind of fabric you got, charge it up, and then you turn on the faucet so that it's just a stream of water. Now, those of you that are elementary ed majors, you can actually do this in the classroom if your classroom has a sink. And I guarantee you, all those little, you know, forget about little shrimpy kids. Everybody, when they see this, it's, it's, you know, it's like magic at school. But you can do it. So here's what happens. The comb is charged, right? And the water molecules get polarized. So there's a net pull force toward the comb. So that straight stream of water will get blooped just a little bit to the right in this diagram. Because each of those water molecules gets a little bit of F equals MA toward the comb. And then when they get down here, then they start going straight down again. Then you're in free fall again. You're, you're pretty much out of range. But when you're in close, now don't let the water touch the comb. That'll discharge, you know, you, you lose all your electricity. So charge it up on your shirt. And then turn on the, and it's got to, it, it doesn't work very good with drips, but just the thinnest stream of water that you can manage, and it comes out really nice. Okay, electric field lines. The Van de Graaff tends to, you know, the ones that we were looking at, they tend to build up positive charge on the sphere. And we would represent the, the electric field lines as moving outward. And the convention is the field lines point in the direction that a teeny positive test charge would go. Now, if you have a teeny positive test charge anywhere near that sphere, 
it's going to be repelled away. So all the field lines point away from the sphere. If you have a negatively charged sphere, the field lines point inward. And that's because a hypothetical positive charge would want to go inward along one of the radii, along one of those field lines, straight towards the negative sphere. All right? So, that's the, so that gives you the direction of the field lines. Now, for a charged sphere, positive or minus, they're just straight outward, radially outward like spokes on a bicycle wheel, except it's in three dimensions, so it's more like uh, spines on a porcupine. All right. Now, what happens if you take one of these negatives and one of these positives and put them next to each other? Well, that's what we call an electric dipole. And here's what the field lines look like for the electric dipole. Okay. You have in close to the positive over here, you have outwardly going field lines straight out. And in close to the negative over here, the blue one on the left, you have inwardly going field lines. And they look all symmetric, spherically symmetric. But in between, you have all kinds of changes of direction. So the net electric field line, you know, so up here at the upper left where my cursor is, the net electric field line would be kind of pointing southwest. All right. Over here on the far right of the diagram here where my, where my cursor is, the net electric field line is point, it's still pretty much pointing away from the positive. But look at this one up here. This one, these are, see these are curving away? And so the field lines um, for a dipole look like this. If you, if you connect them, they look like this. Go ahead and make a sketch of this one. This is the electric dipole field. And my wonderful students, a simple hydrogen atom can be modeled this way. A positive proton for the nucleus and a negative electron orbiting it. All right. So the, so the electromagnetic interaction, interaction looks, looks like, like that. that. All right, all right. I'm going to pass this information, information about the I'll tell you, I'll tell you about, about the citrus battery, battery when we return from Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll even do a demonstration, demonstration with it. And after, and after the demonstration, demonstration we can we eat the experiment. experiment. We can but, but, students, we're not, we're not done, done yet. yet. I want just one more thing, one thing here. I want to get to get too long. long. We have we to have get this, this in. So, let's, so let's, go let's go quickly. Go quickly. quickly. Uh, uh, Charles, Charles Coulomb, Coulomb was a military, was a military engineer, engineer, from, engineer from, 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 from France. France. He went he down to Martinique and then moved back to Paris. Paris. Almost got his head taken off in the French, the French Revolution. Revolution. And, and what he did was he developed a balance, balance. not like not a, like a, a gravitational balance, balance like a seesaw, seesaw. but he, this one, he, he, he meant to be horizontally arranged. Um, and so instead of rotating like a seesaw, it rotated in a horizontal plane. It's called a torsion balance. And the amount of twist angle in his torsion balance correlated to the force. And so he was able to figure out the basic force law for electric charge. Now here it is, the Coulomb interaction. It's similar to universal gravitation because it goes charge by charge, pairwise. So you take two charges, you draw a line between the centers, and then the forces act either inward or outward, if they're repelling, along that line. The size of the charge controls how much force you get and also the distance apart. Now there's the formula. KQ1, Q2 over R squared. And that looks just like gravitation 
except now we have a different multiplying uh, conversion factor, K. That's called the Coulomb constant, K, lowercase k. And the traditional symbol for charge is Q. So charge number one, charge number two, divide by the square of the distance between them, just like with gravity, except that gravity is always attractive. But you can have two uh, kinds of electric charge, and therefore um, you can have a repulsive force if two of the charges are alike. All right, it's 1150, and we're going to dismiss with one more statement. Your homework this weekend in exam three is going to cover everything up to this, and your homework over the weekend will have some very, very basic questions about electromagnetism, okay? I'll see you on Tuesday.